There's a good reason why so many movies that are designed to be scary are set in the woods. Really, the woods at night. And if you go even further, most of them are like a cabin in the woods at night, right? It's because being in the woods at night, as human beings, checks a lot of fear boxes. You have the isolation factor. You're far away from society. That scares us. We don't want to be isolated. You feel more vulnerable that way. You know, it checks the, the darkness fear factor. As humans, we're mostly afraid of the dark because you don't know what's around you or what's looking at you. You know, you don't have the advantage of, you know, city lights beaming in. You're kind of probably removed from lots of light pollution. So you're kind of like in total darkness. And I think the third fear check in the box would be the fact that it's easy to hide in the forest. You don't know what's watching you because there's trees everywhere. You have animals, predators potentially, or even predatory humans that could be hiding at every turn. Hollywood has picked up on that and made bunches of movies of, you know, the whole cabin in the woods trope where somebody's isolated and scared in the woods because it works. It's something that we are afraid of. And so today's story starts off a lot like all the other kind of cliche cabin in the woods scary stories, but this one, it's different. This one scared the heck out of me because as I read the account of what happened in this cabin in the woods, I, I imagine myself being in this guy's position and thinking about the psychological trauma that this would have on you. And my, I've actually had a literal cabin in the woods scary experience and you can check it out. Uh, it's one of my top videos on my YouTube channel. It's, it's uh, what I saw in my room still haunts me. You can check it out. It's my own cabin in the woods story. But having been through something like that, I was able to put myself in this guy's position and this story terrifies me. So as you're listening to today's story, try to put yourself in this guy's position and, and think to yourself, what would you have done? But before we get into today's story, if this type of content appeals to you, the kind of strange, dark, and mysterious that I'm gonna to deliver to you in a story format, if that's kind of your thing, I would ask you to please gently obliterate the like button and then subscribe to my channel and turn on all post notifications so you don't miss any of these strange, dark, and mysterious uploads that I do every week. All right, let's get into today's story. In 2010, a 17-year-old boy is devastated to find out that his father had suddenly passed away. And it really sent shockwaves through the whole family, not only because now they're grieving the loss of their father, their husband, but because so much of their daily lives, they, they spent together. I mean, this was, a, this was a very close family. And one of the things that they liked to do as a family was they owned a cabin. It was around Mount Bachelor in Oregon, this beautiful mountain where you can go snowboarding and skiing. They had this family cabin up there where in the winter time, this family would spend a lot of time there. They would go up there as a family, spend time there as a family. It was this, this wonderful retreat. And as they're trying to settle the estate of their husband, their father, they're trying to figure out what they want to do with this cabin because all of a sudden this place that, you know, used to bring them so much joy and was a place of very fond memories suddenly felt kind of hollow. You know, it just would never be the same. And so they decided that they were actually going to sell this cabin. Um, and the 17 year old boy was just really upset about this. You know, it's, he, he was very close to his father. He had some very fond memories of going hunting and skiing and snowboarding with his dad at this cabin. And so once the cabin was actually put up for sale by this boy's mother, he asked if, you know, before they actually sell it, could he spend some time up there, I guess paying his respects in a way to, to his father, but he just wanted one more opportunity to, to spend some time in that cabin. And his mom said, go for it, you know, take as many days as you want, go up and hang out in the cabin. Uh, but when you come back, we are gonna sell the place. So his father had actually willed to his son his vehicle. And so the 17 year old boy loads up his father's car uh, he goes out and he buys some snacks and drinks, heads up to the cabin in Oregon with the family dog whose name was Midnight. And his plan was just to go up to this cabin and basically try to enjoy being in this space one last time. Don't think about it as this place that now has no meaning because his father had died, but rather a place that he wanted one last positive memory before it was forever gone from their family. And so he gets up there, makes his way to the cabin, and he settles in for what turned out to be an abbreviated stay at the cabin. So in order to understand this story, we need to talk a little bit about the layout of the cabin itself. The, the cabin was two stories. 
and it was built into a mountain, Mount Bachelor in Oregon. And so the back half of the cabin was kind of settled into the mountain. So there were no windows, save a little sliver of window that fed into the, the bathroom actually, in the back of the cabin. The front of the cabin uh, was this beautiful, you know, double decker cabin with, uh, you know, windows on the second floor that fed into the master bedroom. On the second floor, there was a walk out balcony that kind of jutted out a few feet from the second deck. The first floor you could see in through all these beautiful windows. There was a sitting area, like a living room and a TV, and then a small kitchen as well. So the cabin was built in an area that was heavily forested. So they had to clear out, you know, a bunch of trees to even build this cabin when the family had this built years and years ago. And so they really only cleared away the front section of trees so that there was a clear shot to the house, but the sides and the back were very heavily forested with these huge tall pine trees. Um, and they basically had this little tiny driveway that fed in through all the trees and you had this one kind of clearing in front of the cabin. So if you were on the second floor of the cabin where there's the master bedroom, there's a bed up there, and you were looking out that window, you'd be looking over the balcony out into a clearing basically. But there's a tree line, you know, 100 yards past that clearing that's very dense. And there's actually a couple of trees, fairly, fairly prominent trees, that are sitting in front of the cabin that they did not cut down. One of which, for, for the story, we'll call it the sitting tree. Parallel to the ground, about 20 feet up, was this beautiful branch that looked perfect for a whole bunch of people sitting on it. But it was 20 feet above the ground and there wasn't really any way to climb up to it and, and no one was trying to climb this tree. But there's this tree that basically has a, a seat, if you will, like the branch is like a seat that is looking directly into the cabin. And that's gonna matter later in the story. So clearing in front of the cabin with this one kind of sitting tree and then a very dense forest, 360 degrees beyond you know that one clearing. So when the 17 year old gets to the cabin, he goes inside, he puts his drinks in the fridge, puts his snacks on the counter, he hooks up his PlayStation to the TV, and he's just like having a great time. His, his dog Midnight is roaming around, enjoying being at the cabin. And you know, he's having a great time. And over the course of the first two days that he was there, it was everything he hoped it would be. It was, it was like he was bonding with his father one last time. It was a peaceful time that he was there. He was happy to be there. Uh, and he was just enjoying himself eating snacks and playing video games for a couple of days. He actually left a couple times to go snowboarding too. Um, but on the third day that he was there, things started to get pretty weird. So on the third day when he got up, uh, it had snowed dramatically the night before. A couple of feet of snow on the ground, still snowing pretty heavily. And he's like, you know, I just don't feel like brushing off my car and trying to go to the store or go to the slopes to go snowboarding. I'm just gonna basically be shut in for the day. And he was excited about it. He's like, great, me and my dog Midnight can bomb around the inside and play some more video games and eat some more snacks and do whatever. Midday that day, Midnight needed to pee, so he went outside with Midnight and let, let Midnight run around and go to the bathroom. And while he's out there with his dog, he notices there are some footprints in the snow that looked relatively fresh. And this is the first time that he's left his cabin that day, so they aren't his. And his neighbors were pretty far away, and he figured that they were, they were older, that they were probably not gonna be trekking around the woods. So he's thinking to himself, I wonder who made these footprints? And he's looking at them and they, they started in the woods. So the woods are not that far away from where he is. He's in a relatively small clearing just in front of his cabin, but he can tell these fresh footprints have come out of the woods and they're basically right in front of this clearing. And he notices that they bank around and go to the back of his cabin and kind of go up onto the mountain. And he kind of just starts walking and following the footprints a bit and they kind of disappear up onto the mountain behind his cabin. And he's, he's not overly concerned or anything, but he definitely takes note that more than likely somebody was walking around his cabin. Maybe it was someone who got lost, maybe it was a neighbor. I mean, he's rationalizing it. He's thinking, you know what? It, it can't have been anything too serious. Obviously they didn't knock on my door. They didn't need anything. And so he, he kind of writes it off. So that night he stays up late playing video games and his dog is sleeping next to his chair. And at some point he's tired and he wants to go to bed. So he draws all the curtains. So blackout curtains around the downstairs, shuts all the blinds uh, and locks all the windows, all the doors and heads upstairs to the, the lofted second floor where the master bedroom is. He you know, gets in bed, turns off all the lights, everything's locked, everything's shut. The dog climbs into bed and the dog would sleep up near his head. And suddenly the dog jumps up, still on the bed and looks at the stairs leading downstairs to the front door. And 
its ears are perked up, like it, it's heard something. And it wasn't unusual for the dog to be a little jumpy, you know, maybe it heard something. He wasn't overtly concerned. But when midnight, the dog jumps off the bed and sprints downstairs after having this sudden alertness. And he's listening, now he is a little bit worried. He's thinking, well, I, I saw footsteps yesterday walking around my cabin, and now it's the middle of the night and my dog is downstairs acting like it's heard something. And he hears the dog, midnight, pacing around the downstairs, like back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Every indication is the dog wants to go outside. That's, that's the noises that he's, he's picking up that signal from the dog. And so finally, even though he's feeling a little bit unnerved by this, he decides to go down and see what Midnight wants. And so Midnight is by the door, ears perked up, very eager to go outside. It's pacing, you know, and he thinks, you know what, she just needs to go to the bathroom. And so he opens the door with Midnight and he goes outside and he expects his dog to pee. But Midnight doesn't need to pee. Midnight starts kind of stalking around the corner and looking out across the clearing towards the sitting tree in that direction, and it just stops. And it's looking at something very intently, as if it spotted an animal or something in the woods. And so the boy is looking at the dog and he's kind of trying to encourage the dog to, to do its business so they can go back in the, in the cabin. And he's starting to feel really uncomfortable. He's looking around, he's thinking like, okay, I don't know what's going on. Like, I'm a little bit concerned now. And he's sensing that Midnight is going at some point to try to take off after whatever she sees in the woods. And so preemptively, he grabs Midnight and says, all right, drags Midnight back in the house and shuts the door and locks it and takes one last look out the, the window of the door and just kind of looks out. I mean, it's dark, he doesn't have a light or anything. And he's like, man, that's creepy. Locks it, shuts the blinds, confirms everything downstairs is locked. You know, does a sanity check to make sure everything is locked and goes back upstairs with Midnight. Midnight did not want to go back upstairs. He had to practically drag her back upstairs. And then when they did get back in bed, Midnight refused to get in bed, but instead stood next to the bed looking at the stairs, wanting to go downstairs, periodically looking back at him and then down at the stairs. Midnight wanted to go back outside. So he's laying there in bed and he's taking full stock of the fact that his dog is very much on edge, but he's trying to fall back asleep, trying to convince himself that nothing weird is going on. And after about 30 minutes of that and being unsuccessful at falling asleep, as he's laying there, it's silent and all of a sudden he hears footsteps on his roof. Now the roof is right above his head. I mean, he's on the second floor. There is no attic. The roof is right there. And he hears about six footsteps. And he actually described it as, as something with hooves. And his dog instantly looks up as well. And they're both watching the ceiling as what sounds like hooves walking along the roof of this cabin. And it was so distinctive that immediately what he's thinking to himself is, how could a deer or a moose or something get on the roof of the house? There is no way unless you like leapt from a tree or had a ladder for you to get on the roof. And how did we not hear if they leapt from a tree or a ladder even, how didn't we hear a loud slamming sound when they first landed on the roof? Like it's as if they've been there for a while and we just didn't know. And so then the footsteps stop. And at this point, the dog stops looking at the roof and goes right to the balcony, which is shut. There's a door shut to the balcony and there's curtains drawn against the balcony. So he can't see what's out there. And so the 17 year old boy is sitting in his bed and he's like, oh, I don't want to see what's on the porch. And he even says in his write up about this, that he's like, you know, I'm a pretty tough guy, but I am in the middle of the woods in the middle of the night, totally isolated. Like, I almost don't want to know what's going on outside. I just want to pretend it's not happening. But at some point, he musters the courage to go out on the balcony. And so he walks over very timidly to the door and midnight's there ready to go outside. And he takes a deep breath and he slides open the blackout curtains, but there's no light outside and there's no light inside. So it's just kind of darkness. And he can barely make out even just the snow that's on the balcony right in front of him. And he takes a deep breath and he unlocks the door and he opens it up. And the first thing he does is he turns and he looks up at the roof to see if there's a deer or a moose or something on the roof. There's nothing up there and he's kind of peering around and he can't even see footprints up there. So in a way he's kind of relieved, right? Like I, I must've been imagining that. He had a flashlight. And so at this point he's looking back at his roof of his cabin and he shines the light real quick and it's totally dark out, right? So this light goes very far and he sees nothing. And the dog at this point, he can hear the dog making kind of some commotion below him. It's angling itself 
to look out in the direction of the sitting tree and out towards that tree line where the dog had originally been fixated on something in the tree line. And so just doing his diligence, the 17 year old scans from the top of the roof where he sees nothing. He starts scanning over to the side of the house, right? Like this is the direction of the sitting tree. He's looking over here and he's looking, he's scanning the tree line, just looking for anything that might've been on the roof. And he's looking and he's looking and he's looking and then he gets to the sitting tree and his flashlight stops on a man crouched on that perch 20 feet off the ground on the sitting tree who looked very tall. He had his hands holding onto the branch right above him and his mouth is open and he's holding onto the branch and he's looking directly at the boy unblinking 100% focused on him. He's less than 50 yards away from him at this point. And it took him a second, the 17 year old, to register what his flashlight was pointed at. And he panics and he drops it. And the dog reacts to the drop flat flashlight too. And because he's alone out here, he needs to protect himself. So he scoops that light back up and he shines it one more time to see like, holy cow, like what did I just see? And this, the guy on the branch is now gone. And he scans the ground, there's nothing. And he's terrified at this point. So he grabs his dog, throws Midnight back into the, into the cabin, runs back in, shuts the door, locks it, closes the blinds, turns off his light, and literally gets back in bed with his dog. And he's now basically cowering on the bed. So at this point, they're sitting on the bed. Midnight is no longer acting like she wants to go outside. I think she's picking up potentially on the, on the paranoia. Okay. At this point, the boy and his dog are sitting on the bed and they're both scared at this point. Midnight, you know, was fearsome while she was outside, but now that she's back inside, she doesn't want to go near the door either. She's, she's rubbing up against him. She doesn't want to go anywhere. And they're sitting there and the boy, all he's thinking to himself is, did I really just see that? It looked like an unnaturally tall man. How did he get in the tree? That's 20 feet off the ground. You know, there's no way to get up into the tree. And why was it sitting there with its mouth open, staring at me? And who was on the roof? Was anything on the roof? And if this thing can get 20 feet up into a, into a tree, it certainly can get on the roof of my, my cabin, I would imagine. But what was it? So he's having this type of thought process and he's realizing too, that it's not that late in the night. He still has hours until the sun's gonna come up. And as he's basically panicking and feeding off his own paranoia and it's getting worse and worse by the second, he hears tapping on the door, on the front door of his cabin. And his heart sinks and he and his dog kind of look in the direction of the tapping and he knows he's not gonna go open the door. He knows the door is locked. He knows everything is locked. He's panicking that maybe it wasn't, but he knows he locked it. And the tapping just sounds like a finger tapping on the window. And at some point the tapping stops and he thinks, okay, maybe they'll just go away. And then he hears what sounds like footsteps outside and then tapping begins on the side of his cabin, not the front door anymore, like the wall of the cabin. Now it's a little bit louder. The tapping continues up the side of the house and then it stops. And he's sitting there and he's thinking, whatever this is, is walking around my cabin. And then he hears tapping on the little slit that is the window that feeds into the bathroom that's right behind the bedroom that he's in right now. So six feet away, maybe 10 feet away, whatever this thing is, it's now literally just a small pane of glass away tapping on the glass. And so now he's petrified and he's just hoping that this thing goes away. It doesn't. It goes to the other side of the cabin and starts tapping on the wall on the other side of the cabin and makes it all the way back to the front where it begins tapping on the glass of the front window, back to the door. And he's just thinking like, whatever this is, is walking around my cabin, tapping all over my cabin. And then all the tapping stops and his heart's racing. You know, it's the middle of the night. He's, he's in the middle of the woods somewhere. He's totally isolated. And then it's like his worst nightmare comes true. He hears footsteps on his balcony and then tapping right on the big sliding glass doors of, of the door leading out to the balcony. And he knows that right behind a blackout curtain and a pane of glass is this tall man, more than likely, who's right on his balcony. And the tapping on the balcony goes on and on and on. And then all of a sudden it stops. And he's just waiting for it to open the door and come inside but it doesn't, instead it goes on the roof and it starts tapping on the roof directly above him. And the tapping continues all night. And so finally the sun comes up, you know, he hasn't slept all night and he finally gets the courage to go over to the balcony and open up the curtains and see what's out there. And when he does, there is nothing out there, but there's footprints as if someone had been pacing on the balcony all night. He opens it up and he 
finally just jumps out and looks up on his roof. There's nothing on his roof. He can see all these footprints on his roof. He looks down and it's up a racetrack of footprints all around his house. Someone had been basically stalking his house all night and then the footsteps retreat all the way to the sitting tree and then go back into the woods. He packed up his stuff, he left, and he couldn't have been happier that the family sold that cabin because he was never gonna go back. So to this day, he has no idea what it was. And even if it was just a person who was tapping on your windows and your walls and your, and your roof and your balcony, even if it was just a human being doing that, that would be horrifying, let alone if it was something else, something paranormal. And so if you want to check out my video about my experience, it's on my channel called What I Saw in My Room Still Haunts Me. Um, it's eerily similar to the one that I just described of the 17-year-old in Oregon. And so I'd love to hear in the comments what you think was doing all that tapping. And if it's possible, if that was just some person screwing with this poor kid or maybe it was something else. So let me know in the comments and I'll, be, I'll try to get back to as many people as I possibly can. If you haven't already, please, if you like this story, gently obliterate the like button and subscribe and turn on all post notifications so you can get three to four videos just like this every week. If you wanna get in touch with me, you can hit me up on Instagram. My handle is johnballin416. Uh, I'm also quite active on TikTok. My handle is mrballin over there and I go live on there all the time, 10 o'clock Eastern, most days of the week. So I hope to see you in, in one of those other places and I hope you'll continue to watch my videos here on YouTube. And that's gonna do it guys. Thank you very much. Till next time.